At the new Plainfield Bacchus Emergency Care Center, we're opening new doors to better health. More than just a 24-7 emergency room, the new center provides services you and your family need to get better, stay healthy, and be well. Choose wisely. Choose Bacchus. I feel a little bit like Walter Cronkite this morning. <laughs> I know there's a few people in the room who probably remember what I'm talking about. I remember as a young man, my dad forced me to watch Walter Cronkite every night to get the news. And I think he was probably one of the most articulate storytellers in existence. Yet on the day that Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, he sat there at his desk and as he watched and listened to this happen, at a certain point he just took off his glasses and he said, in his most articulate fashion, wow. <laughs> That's how I feel today, wow. And what I want to do up here this morning is respond to the two questions that I've received most as we've endeavored to get this project going. First question is, why a National Coast Guard Museum? And then the second one is, why New London? So let me respond to the first one by reading an email to you that I received recently. And this will explain why I believe there's a need for a Coast Guard Museum. I met a seaman apprentice back a couple years ago named Roy McKay, and I took a liking to him immediately. So the first thing that caught my attention when I asked him where he was from, he says, I'm from Canada. He was a Canadian citizen that was inspired to come to the United States because he wanted to serve in the United States Coast Guard. He wanted to be a rescue swimmer. He wanted to jump out of helicopters and save people. Now, I don't know why anybody wants to jump out of a perfectly good <laughs> helicopter, but that's what he wanted to do. So I've uh, maintained contact with him over the years, and I check in every once in a while to see how he's doing. So I checked in just about a week ago because I needed to get some information from him, and he responded, and I just want to read a portion of this. He said, as you know, I wanted to go to rescue swimmer school, and that didn't work out. So I took a step back and looked at what else there was for me. Then I chose to be an aviation electronics technician. You see, Admiral, to be honest, it really didn't matter what I got to do in the Coast Guard. I just wanted to be in the Coast Guard. To me, this isn't a job, it's a lifestyle. I've made some of the best friends in the service, and I always tell people that I gained 40,000 brothers and sisters when I came in. I'm living the dream, Admiral. As you already know, this is by far the best service to be a part of. Take care, Admiral. I'll be here standing to watch. Semper Paratus. <laughs> McKay became a U.S. citizen, and he's serving at Air Station San Diego right now, going out there living the dream. But those 40,000 brothers and sisters he talked about deserve a monument. They deserve a museum. And those hundreds of thousands of Coast Guardsmen who have come before Roy McKay and others deserve a tangible, visible monument to their commitment, to their sacrifice, to their service. This museum will serve that role of honoring those brave young and men and women who have continuously stepped forward, raised their hand, sworn to defend the Constitution of the United States, and then put on the uniform of the United States Coast Guard. They deserve it. That's why I want this museum. I also want this museum for Catherine Beasley. Where is she? Did she leave? There she is. <laughs> Catherine Beasley has received an admission to the Coast Guard Academy for the class of 2017. an alumnus with me at some point in time, uh, but we're already related because I'm a graduate of the Norwich Free Academy and she is a student at the Norwich Free Academy. Now this was not a prop, I didn't set this up, I just happened, I happened to meet her while we were preparing this morning when we arrived here, but we need a museum for all the Catherine Beasleys out there as well, and to attract more Catherine Beasleys to come into this great service. That's why we need a museum. So let me respond to why New London? 
I had the great privilege uh, just a, about a year ago to go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. My staff surprised me. I didn't know this was coming. And when we went up to the, in the archives, the, the archivist, the top man, took me up to a vault. And in that vault, along with four other archivists, they had arrayed 222 years of documents related to the United States Coast Guard. And I'm not going to cover all of them, because I could sit here and talk all morning about the wonderful treasure trove of information that I saw that day. Everything from the beginning of the service all the way through Deepwater Horizon, Hurricane Katrina, etc. And they find, the archivists love having me there, because they find the United States Coast Guard to be much more fascinating than any of the other services, because of the predecessor services and how this service was formed over the years. But the thing that I treasured the most, it was a great big package sitting on the table, covered with thick cardboard, and they put on white gloves, they opened up the cover, and there are these stacks of parchment sheets with beautiful calligraphy on them. And on the top of the first page, it said, The Tariff Act of 1790. They flipped to the back page, and they are signed into law on the 4th of August, 1790, George Washington. And then they moved into the middle of the bill, and they showed me a paragraph in there, and it said, the Secretary of the Treasury has authorized the construction of 10 cutters at a cost not to exceed $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get any shipyard to give that yet. <laughs> so once again, why New London? Well, because the fourth cutter to be built out of those 10 was built here in New London. The cutter Argus, built here in a shipyard in New London. I'm going to give this to our new Coast Guard history class at the Academy to do a research project. I want to find out where that shipyard was. So I don't know exactly where it was built in New London, but it served here for 13 years. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that if you walk down on Bank Street, stop at the Customs House, and if you look down the alley at that wharf that sits behind the Customs House, there's no doubt in my mind that the revenue cutter Argus moored up there as it uh, went out and deployed and patrolled the waters off Connecticut and Rhode Island for those 13 years. It's a direct connection to the beginnings of our service in 1790 to New London. And of course, we've been here inextricably linked to New London ever since. The Coast Guard Academy itself moving here in 1910 to come ashore for the first time at Fort Trumbull and establish a shore base school. And of course, moving up to its current location in 1932. And all the thousands and thousands of cadets and enlisted members and civilians and auxiliarists that have worked here in the city, come through the academy, and worked on projects over the years, we are inextricably linked to this city. And rather than say, why New London, I say, why not New London? That's the question to be asked. So I've had the great pleasure and opportunity, honor, and privilege to represent this country sailing around the world. I've lost track, literally, of how many countries I've been to. But I know on Eagle alone, when I was her captain for those three years, we visited 15 countries during those three years. And I visited a total of 35 overseas ports, and then many other ports around the United States. <coughs> Every time I went into a port, I was amazed by the beauty of the waterfronts, things people have done with the natural resources they have that lie along the river or lie along the bay, making them focal points for their cities to bring tourists and people and celebrations to the waterfront. And as you do that, as you bring people back into the city, to the waterfront, life springs from the waterfront back into the rest of the city. You need a focal point, you need something central to the city, and waterfront property is magnificent to be taken advantage of. I said the same thing back in 1999, uh, the last time I got underway with Eagle. Uh, Admiral Doug Thiessen, who's here today, was with me at the pier, and uh, we were preparing for Op Sale 2000, and we all had a great deal of enthusiasm. We thought, this is it, this is the point, this is the turnaround for New London. This is what will make us great again. And I left with a speech and I said, why not New London? I talked about all the beautiful waterfronts I had seen throughout the world. And I said, why not New London? Well, we can't just go down to the waterfront when we have the waterfront festivals. We need to have something that's attracting people down to the waterfront all the time. And I believe this museum will do it. 
So it will serve that purpose of serving as a wonderful monument and teaching tool to all those people who have served in the Coast Guard. It will educate the public about our United States Coast Guard. And I believe it will serve as a magnet to bring people down to the waterfront and revitalize this city that we all love so much. So, why not, New London? We all, we have to do is think big, we have to have focus, we have to have commitment. I'm committed to this, and this commitment will go beyond my service in the United States Coast Guard. This museum will be built, it will thrive, and we are going to restore this waterfront to its grandeur. And I want to thank the Connecticut delegation. I've got to thank the mayor. He's done a wonderful job. You know, I'm not a politician. He's been able to bring a lot of disparate parties together in order to uh, get this kicked off. And uh, I think he's done a great job of it. Uh, I, and I want to thank Mr. Jimmy Coleman and his dedication, his effort. And he has, he's had some ups and downs and course changes along the way. One thing I know how to do is steer a steady course. And we are going to do that. So let me wrap up by making one more statement. I have a fictional character who I love. It's called Captain Jack Aubrey, Master and Commander. Russell Crowe played him in the movie. Whenever faced with indomitable odds and challenges and disaster, whatever it might be, whenever everybody comes to him and tells him about problems, we can't do this, we can't do that, it's going to be impossible to do it, he says, well then, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's not a moment to lose. All, all ahead full. Thank you.